Well, we will uh, begin with prayer here. It's 10 o'clock and uh, be on our way. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all of those that are gathered here. I uh, pray also for those that aren't here, uh, some for, for good reason, uh, family, friends visiting, and we pray that uh, they have enjoyable time with their family. Uh, some of them are, are sick and under the weather, and we pray for swift healing for them. Uh, be with them in that time when they, they feel crummy and low energy and all of that. And uh, you, Lord, provide that healing in their body. Give them patience as they also struggle with wanting to feel better, but, but never quite being there. And be with all of us. Uh, keep us safe. Keep us healthy as well, um, not only in our, our physical sense, but we pray for that spiritual health. Uh, we enter the season of Lent today uh, as we recognize it. Uh, and Ash Wednesday is, is a day when we are reminded of our frailty, of our mortality, of our own sin. And uh, that can give us pause, Lord. To, to understand that, that we are in need of redemption, that we are in need of forgiveness. And yet, Lord, to see that those needs have been more than satisfied in the gift of Jesus, uh, our, our great Valentine, who loved us so much that he came to lay down his life for us so that we might have life through him. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, as we begin Lent, we know that the journey uh, goes through the cross, but it also goes through the empty tomb. And we thank you for that joy that will come on Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We have um, an interesting couple of sections here in Mark's gospel, and um, it's kind of hard to break them up right. I... I've, I try to chunk things in like logical sections, and um, last week was pretty easy. I said last week was really um, a transition piece, as it, it kind of points us forward to some new developments. Um, we've seen Jesus in his early ministry. We, we have the call of disciples. Uh, we have a crowd that also kind of is around him that is a little different than the disciples, but they're also um, people who oppose him. And the opposition not only has been clearly defined, but their purpose has also been now laid bare, that they have come to destroy him. And so Mark kind of resets us, and, and again, it, it's more of the same. It's Jesus' ministry, but, but there's now another part to it. And our reading for today really establishes that, that distinction, whereas before it was Jesus doing ministry. It was Jesus healing people. It was Jesus casting out demons. It was Jesus calling disciples to follow him. Um, this reading today isn't going to quite get us there, but it's going to introduce us to the idea of Jesus is going to have apostles, and by definition, an apostle is one who's going to be sent out to do the same kind of thing that Jesus was doing. So, so now there's kind of a new layer. Having a disciple is one who would follow him, but now we're going to have apostles who are from the disciples, but are now going to be sent out with authority to do the kinds of things that only Jesus was doing. Which, again, the question always before us in Mark's gospel is, who is this guy? Who is this guy who not only has the authority in himself to do some of these amazing and marvelous things, but now shares that authority, gives that authority to this other group, and they're now going to be acting on his behalf. Um, and what you see is that, too, is going to be a, a foretaste or a foreshadowing of what will happen in a much greater way after the resurrection. Right. Um, we, we know about the apostles primarily or we think about them as those who are sent on Pentecost to, to go forth and make disciples of all nations. But here is where that all begins um, in Jesus's own ministry. He will use these apostles and send them forth. So their their job only changes a little bit because the commission will change. Um, here, the main commission is they're going to kind of prepare the way for Jesus to enter some of these other villages. Um, and when, when it's after the resurrection, 
Um, Jesus has done everything. Everything necessary has been accomplished. They're eyewitnesses to his whole ministry, which includes his crucifixion, which includes his resurrection and ascension. All right. Um, and the other thing I apologize for is uh, I type all this out on my computer, obviously. And if you know on your computer, you can zoom in and whatever. And so sometimes the font size that you see on the screen isn't what prints out. Um, and so that opening font is a little bit smaller than I, I usually have it. So if it's harder to read, I apologize. All right. Um, hello, Tom. And did you grab him an extra copy so he has his ready? Excellent. Okay, so Mark three thirteen through 19. And he, that is Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons." He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, um, that is, son of, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Okay, so you'd think there's really not a lot to say here because most of the section was just a list of people's names. Uh, but no, what do I give you? Like a nine-page handout. So there is actually a lot going on. Um, so Mark's Gospel, uh, again, we, we tr it's helpful to try to read each Gospel on its own merits. So we know that there are four, four accounts uh, of Jesus's life, and it's hard not to import information from one to the other. And, and in a sense, like that's natural, it's, it's good. But like to understand a gospel and its own purposes, you, you kind of have to put on blinders sometimes and just say, what's the, what's the version that Mark wants to give to us? What is his account? Because when you do that, you start to see small nuances um, in, in that gospel versus you just automatically import everything. So I'm going to make a mistake here and I'm going to import something just in comparison. Um, Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel both include a very significant um, lengthy teaching of Jesus to crowds of people. And the only, the content is very much the same in Matthew and in Luke. The distinction is Matthew has it where Jesus goes up on a mountainside and begins to preach. And so therefore, everything that he says after that, we refer to the geography, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. So that's hap that happens in chapter 6 in Matthew's Gospel. It's the very beginning. Um, and again, it's very lengthy treatment. Luke doesn't have Jesus give a teaching on a mountain. Rather, he has, a, again, content's pretty similar, but it's a fairly lengthy sermon, and the geography is on a plane. Not, not an airplane, but, you know, a flat area. Um, and... It would seem, if you kind of just compare things, that uh, it's not like, oh, did these guys remember this different? Um, I, I don't want to say this in a bad way, but think of Jesus as like a politician. Politicians, when they go on their campaigns, they have a stump speech, right? It's the same thing, the same jokes, the same lines, you know, in, in every single city. Maybe they change it slightly, but they, they kind of have one talk. Um, Jesus, who has one message, he's come to bring the kingdom of God. I, I, I don't think it would be unreasonable. It would be quite natural of he, he gives kind of the same basic sermons in some of these cities. Obviously, there are things that will change over time. And he does give different messages to different groups. But both Matthew and Luke kind of say, here's a pretty lengthy teaching. And he, he's given it in a few different contexts. 
Now, the reason why I point that out is because Mark does not have a Sermon on the Mount or a Sermon on the Plain. In fact, Mark's gospel is kind of enigmatic in the sense that already a few different times we've encountered where Jesus teaches the people, but Mark doesn't tell us a single thing that he teaches, or it's very limited. Um, and so this is a difference in Mark's gospel compared to the other two. And again, in a sense, that only you only realize that as you compare them. Of whereas the other gospels will give lengthy teachings of Jesus, Mark does have teachings, don't get me wrong, but he focuses a lot more on the actions of Jesus, on, on some of these significant stories of healings, um, casting out demons, and then the reactions of people to him, which is why I've I've said repeatedly, it seems like Mark is trying to draw out the response of people to Jesus to get you, the reader, to ask that same question for yourself of, you know, where am I going to align? Am I going to be more like the Pharisees and the Herodians that, that reject Jesus? Am I going to be more like the disciples that are, that are ready to follow him, to put their trust in him? Or am I more like the crowd where... He's an interesting guy. I kind of want to hear more, but I'm not ready to reject him. I'm also not ready to, you know, buy into it either. I, I just, I'm just more curious. And the way Mark writes the gospel, it's just kind of built up that way. Awesome. Yes. On a mountain, you can get a plateau. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what they call the plain in those days. Uh, I mean, we think of a plain as in the valley. Yeah, yeah. So again, you also can look at the exact um, teaching of Luke, and it, and it doesn't line up exactly. So again, you know, if, if it's a sermon, did did he th did Matthew think there were more important things, and Luke thought there were different things? Mm -hmm. um, in Matthew's gospel, it comes quite early. In Luke's gospel, it comes a, a little bit later in the ministry, um, and and. So, again, the way, the way that I deal with it is, is just he taught many things on many different occasions. The Lord's Prayer is an example of this. In Matthew's Gospel, the Lord's Prayer is taught in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's Gospel, it's taught in a different context where Jesus' disciples approach him and say, John's disciples um, were taught how to pray by John. Can you teach us how to pray? Um, and, again... Jesus could have already taught the Lord's Prayer, but again, well, the disciples are like, that's what you taught the crowd. Maybe there's like, you know, is there a special prayer that we can pray because we're the insiders? But Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer again in Luke's Gospel, which again, depending on how you read it, the point is there is no special prayer, like that, that the insiders have one prayer to pray and, and those you know, the crowds, we, we give them a different prayer. Like, no, it's it's the same prayer. Um, but the other thing would be Jesus could have just said to them, don't you remember, I already taught you the prayer. In Luke's gospel, he doesn't do that. And um, I kind of, again, my way of dealing with that is I know as, as a student in a classroom, um, once I've kind of looked over notes for a test, like, you, you sort of realize that teachers sometimes introduce concepts multiple times. And the first time, you weren't really paying attention to it. And then the second, you're like, oh, this is brand new information. And then when you're studying for the exam, you're like, oh, no, that wasn't actually brand new. They, they did tell us about that earlier. I just, you know, it didn't all process. And do the disciples need repetition? They, they surely do, um, ju just like all of us do. So he can teach the same thing on multiple times because we sometimes need to hear it on multiple times. Okay, so the reason why I dragged all of that into play is because how this begins. It begins with Jesus going up on a mountain. Now, previously, he's been alongside the sea. We've talked about that. And the sea will come back into play. Remember I said that Mark's, that section we had last time, is kind of introducing a motif, a theme that we'll come back to. However, he's changed, he's changed it. Because before, when Jesus was alongside the sea, on two different occasions, 
it was in the context of him calling disciples to follow him. Now the context is going to change. It's going to be sending out these apostles, sending out the disciples. So they've already been following him. Now it's going to be the sending him. So, so that comes into play. But if you know the other gospels really well, when Jesus comes to a mountain, you're prepared for kind of a, a teaching moment. Um, in our church, we just had the previous Sunday, the, the transfiguration. And so that was, that all took place on a mountain. Uh, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain. And it, it was a great revelation to them to see Jesus in his glory, um, and Moses and Elijah there too. But but what that really called into play to me, and, and so I kind of I preached on this a little bit, was, was both Moses and Elijah have some, some very major encounters with God on a mountain. And with both of them, there, there are specific instructions given to them on a mountain. So there they do encounter God in his glory. Um, it's manifested in different ways. For Moses, God's glory was manifested in the, the great cloud, the thunder, the earthquake, and all of that. And when Elijah later on comes to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, which is also called same mountain, um, he experiences um, a great wind, an earthquake, and a fire. Some of those things that were associated with Sinai, but it specifically said God was not in those things. It was only a still small voice that happened at the end of that. That's where God was present. Um, so Old Testament, you have all of this baggage of when, when there's a mountain and God's people, there's, there's a great revelation, there's teaching, there's a commissioning. Um, Moses is commissioned on Mount Sinai. Elijah was already a prophet before he came to Sinai, but on Sinai, he was sent back with a specific commission. You're supposed to anoint this guy, the king of Israel, this guy, the king of Judah, and oh, by the way, anoint Elisha to be a prophet who will succeed you. So, you know, there, there's all of that. And the Sermon on the Mount itself is, is all of those things. But Mark, yes, there's a mountain, yes, there's a commissioning, but, but no real teaching that accompanies it. Um, that may have just been the way that it happened. That may be the way that Mark just wants to focus our attention again, because again, as Mark is writing the gospel, he's like, you guys know the teachings of Jesus. I, I'm not going to I'm not going to rehash the same stuff. I want you to focus on, on this. And so um, just the fact that Jesus goes up on the mountain, my point is contextually in the story of the Bible, you're prepared for something really important to happen here. And something important does happen. Um, he called to him those whom he desired. So... We've just had a crowd of people following Jesus alongside the sea. Um, who are the people that, that he's calling to himself? You could think that's the disciples, um, which so far are an undefined group. Um, again, we read the Bible backwards. We already know there's going to be the 12. So is this the 12 that he's talking about? Well, no, we, we don't know how many it is. It's just those that he has called to himself. Mark, in his gospel, has specifically given us five. So Simon and Andrew, James and John, and Levi. Those were the five that specifically have been named, and, and we just, we're going to lump those there. But we also know there were crowds of people that followed Jesus. How many among those crowds became his disciples? Mark just doesn't focus on that, and we don't know. And so we don't know specifically how... There's going to be a smaller subset here. There will be 12, but how many was it from whom Jesus chose the 12? Was it 100? Was it 50? Was it 500? We don't know. Mark doesn't focus on it. But what we're, what we're supposed to see is there is a smaller group from a 
larger group. Jesus is selective, but those that are there are those whom he desires. And that's real that's that's really interesting because you know, you very much know in the end of this list, and Mark highlights it, one of those whom he desired would betray him. Um, this is no accident. Je Jesus knows what's going to happen. But it has to be this way. And, and so he, he calls all of these 12 to him. Um, John's gospel really focuses on this um, idea too. Um, Jesus specifically a couple of different times said in John's gospel, um, did I not choose you, the 12? That's at the bottom of the first page of the handout, John 6. Did I not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? Um, he, again, he, he knows it. Um, he, he, he called it, but um, he, he knows that the purposes of God cannot be accomplished without Judas. He doesn't condemn Judas, um, but he knows what Judas will ultimately do. Um, John 15, same kind of thing with a little less foreboding. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. So Jesus has the group that he desires. It's a motley crew. They're not perfect. Um, but I think it's, it's not wrong to understand that though we may not be among this group of 12, the apostles, that, that this is also always true of us, that, that he knows whom he has called, and he has called all of us. And sometimes people doubt that call of God. And, you know, again, they see themselves. They see their own lives. They see their own failures. I'm not really that good. I doubt, you know, um, I sin, all of that. And, and yet he still calls us. And we talk about in, in Lutheran theology and, and other Christian groups would, would be able to line up with this too, um, that God gives us the gift of baptism, for instance, so that we never have to doubt the calling of God. That is to say, when, when we say, I'm not sure if he really called me, what we're doubting within ourselves is this internal dialogue, um, that, it, that it's this internal calling that, did I really hear him? Did, did he really call me? Or am I just making this all up? Am I crazy? And the gift of baptism, among other things, is that it's an external thing. So it comes from outside of you, and you cannot doubt that external thing because it happened to you. And that's what the disciples experienced in their own lives. Jesus physically was there with them and said, you, follow me. They could always doubt their own internal sense of, am I really all of that? But Jesus could always say to them, listen, it's not about how you feel. I called you. And you can never doubt that external call of Jesus. It's there and it's valid. So for us in those future generations where we're like, well, gee, pastor, I've never had the voice of Jesus call me. I, I don't really know if I belong or not. To me, that's one of the great gifts of baptism that's given to the church of it's, it's a different thing, I understand, but it's given with the same authority of Jesus. It happens in the name of Jesus. And it's this external thing that is given to us so that when we look to ourselves and we're like, boy, I'm not really sure if I, if I have faith or not, if, if, I'm, you know, if I'm in the in crowd or if I'm condemned, maybe I'm the Judas of the bunch. And our baptism says, no. You are called. You are forgiven. The Holy Spirit has, has been given to you. Um, and, and you have everything necessary for salvation. Live that life now. Follow that path. Um, because it really is important that Jesus knows who he calls and he desires them. God loves all people and all people are sinners. So if we all respectively doubt this, this internal calling, 
I mean, the answer is right. None of us are good enough. But that's why the gospel is so sweet, because none of us belong, but Jesus wants all of us. And, and never doubt that. So um, we know all of the apostles. We know their stories. We know that none of them are perfect. But, but Mark draws attention to the fact that with a very clear purpose, he has called them and he wants them there. And because he wants them there, what happens? They come to him. Again, they respond to that call. Just as they did to be disciples, they respond to him um, in this new calling to be apostles. All right, so verse 14, he appointed 12. So now we have a distinct number. Again, we don't know how many disciples total Jesus has. Um, in other accounts, there's also a sending of 70 or 72. So we know we have at least that many. We know in the Acts of the Apostles, which comes after the four Gospels, um, to replace Judas, the the apostles get together and say, let us choose one who's been with us from the beginning. So they have two candidates, Justus and Matthias. Matthias is ultimately the one who's chosen. But the fact that they, they have to make a smaller selection, again, reminds us that there is the 12 here, but Jesus has been accompanied and will be accompanied by a greater undefined number of disciples. Um, why 12, though? Why, why this, this distinct group? That, that seems to be the, the answer that we find. Um, again, Jesus kind of alludes to that because in the Gospels, he will say that the 12 will be judges over the 12 tribes, so again, it seems like that's why, you know, if you had 13, well, there weren't 13 tribes. Um, the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament is just to stand symbolically for all of Israel. Um, realize when the Israelites left Egypt, um, there, there were the 12 tribes of Israel. And the 12 tribes were not actually the 12 sons of of. Jacob, who is called Israel, um, because, well, they, I mean, they were, but when, when they come to Mount Sinai, there's some, <laughs> some crazy math that happens. The tribe of Levi will not be counted among the 12. They're going to be set apart, and they're going to be priests for the tabernacle. So, so they don't get a count. Neither will Joseph get a count. Joseph is, is also not given a count, but he's given two. Joseph has two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and those two will be counted separately. So we had 12, take away Levi, take away Joseph. He's not one of the tribes. Add back Manasseh, add back Ephraim. Now we have 12. So the 12, like, the 12 has always sort of been a symbolic number, but who, who made up the 12, depending on where you look in the Old Testament, it was, it was a different kind of numbering. Um, symbolically, in, in the Old Testament, three is, is God's number, uh, the Trinity, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, four tends to stand for creation. So the four points of the compass, or in the Bible, the four winds from the north, east, southwest. Like that means the totality of all of creation. In, in Revelation, you'll find that there are four creatures or whatever. And so it's, it's all of creation is, is kind of symbolized in that. So sometimes in the Bible, how you put those numbers together can mean special things. So four, creation's number, three, God's number, you add that together, you get seven, and that is a number of completion and fullness. So God creates on six days, but there's that seventh day, and that's the fullness of all creation, right? Um, and seven is elsewhere used as a number of perfection, um, so we have that there. So four plus three, you get the seven, but four times three, 
that's where you get 12. Mm -hmm. And so that 12 stands for the people of God. So you have God and, and he adopts this group of people. Um, as, as we say that, you also have to remember the narrative of the Old Testament. God chooses Israel to be the people through whom the Messiah comes. He never chooses Israel and says, I don't care about the rest of the people, the rest of the nations. Israel was always to be a light to the nations that would draw other people into the promise of the Messiah. No, the Messiah would not come through their bloodline, through their families. God specifically did choose Israel, but that the Messiah would come for them too. Um, Sometimes that gets lost in the Old Testament because all the stories focus so much on, on this group of people and we think, oh, God doesn't care about the others. And again, that's, that's never true. And so we see in the Old Testament from time to time, it happened in the Exodus, among those who came in the Exodus were also some of the Egyptians that finally said, wait a second, these people's God is the God. Our gods could not stop this God. And so there were some of these people that came out from them. When they enter the Holy Land, um, we hear the story of Rahab, right? And she enters into the bloodline of, of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, where they we have the account. Um, she's one of the ones that shows up, right? And... Um, so I, I, this is on my head because Beverly just showed me a name, Naaman, during the ministry of Elijah. Elijah came, the prophet, to speak to the king of Israel to say, repent, you have started worshiping other gods. But then ironically, Elijah, in a lot of his ministry, he is taken in and accepted by non-Jewish people. And, and there's a widow at Zarephath, uh, for instance. Um, and then Elisha, in his ministry, he uh, heals this man named Naaman, who's a Syrian. So he's, he's not a Jew. He's not from Israel. Um, and so they're there. So again, when we say, either in the Old Testament or in the New, that it symbolizes Israel, think, when you think Israel, don't think, a specific family tree Israel, but the true Israel, that is all people who would believe in God and his promises. That's the true offspring of Abraham. So these 12, we kind of then make a distinction of there's the Old Testament church and, and the 12 tribes sort of speaks to the whole of that. And they were all people that believed in the Messiah that was to come. And then you have the New Testament church, which the 12 apostles sort of stand at the head of that. And there are those that now have seen the Messiah and believe in him. But the two are, are ultimately united. And so in the New Testament, Paul will talk about the apostles, but he ultimately brings their faith back to Abraham and the Old Testament. And, and that's the foundation upon which they were all built because there was the promise of the Messiah and now the Messiah has come. Like, you can't have the Messiah without the promise. They're, they're all connected. Um, so while it does seem like this is another chapter in the story, also don't understand that this is a rejection of the Old Testament and now God is, is doing a new thing. There, there is much continuity here. But these guys are, have a unique role, and, and that unique role is going to be defined. Um, and, and so we say that we are part of the apostolic church. Um, and again, in, within Christianity, there's some, there's some argument about what that means. Um, some believe that it means that you have to be able to track your church to a given apostle, apostolic succession. Um, and... and the Lutheran Church isn't necessarily uh, on that line, but rather what we say is, no, the true apostolic church is the church that confesses the faith 
that the apostles taught and spread. And so whether or not I can connect my faith to one of the guys on this list, that's not the thing. The thing is the same faith that was taught by all of them and then spread generation after generation, it's that same faith recorded in scripture that I believe. And so, yeah, I, I belong to the apostles, uh, the apostles creed. You know, it's it's that faith which we um, have between us that, that brings us together as Christians. Okay, so 12 seems to be symbolic, seems to signify God's people as a whole. Yes, there's now a development um, from the 12 tribes of Israel, but there, there's also a sense of, of continuity. Um, any other questions on, on just why, why 12? Again, Jesus doesn't say why 12. This is all implied, but Jesus does say some things that do connect the 12 back to the 12 tribes of Israel. Terry? This is a thought, and yeah. it was from one of the previous lessons. Yeah. But there's got to be humans in this world mm -hmm. that have never heard of Jesus and God. Mm -hmm. And if so... Do they go to heaven or hell? <laughs> God, God's call, Terry. It's God's call. Yeah. And the way I kind of think about it is uh, those that go to hell are the ones that verbally do not acknowledge God, even though they've been taught. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they never had the chance mm -hmm. to deny him because mm -hmm. they didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's my yeah, I mean, so just just so you know why I always kind of don't answer that question, <laughs> what what happens if you say, oh, of, of course they're saved if they didn't hear hear about Jesus? What what happens to what what do we know in Scripture? Are, are we violating any words of, of Scripture if we would say that? I mean, so John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to God except through him. So if I say, oh, it doesn't matter if I'm, and, and that puts me in a rather uncomfortable position. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say that. But um, on the other side, uh, and, and this would be kind of feeding into it, uh, if, if that were true, if people who didn't have a chance to hear about Jesus are, are either given a free pass or the criterion is, is different, by telling them about Jesus, the criterion has now changed. If, if they were, were, we could potentially be condemning those people that ignorance was bliss, but now they know and not everybody will accept that word. We've, you know, oh gosh, have I? And, and that's contrary to the Great Commission. The Great Commission was no go and tell all nations. Um, but what we say is God has constrained us to his word. We, I don't know anything different than what he has said, but he, he can act of his own will. So, so God is the judge. I'll let, I'll let him figure that out. He is a God of, of grace and mercy, but um, we should live our lives as if their salvation depends on knowing about Jesus because that's what he has clearly said to us. But I do know... It, it rubs us really hard, like, wait a second, you mean God would condemn them just because they had, and, and in scripture, the answer is, no, God isn't condemning them because they haven't heard, it's, it's because of sin. And even if you haven't heard about Jesus, does sin exist? Again, scripture says, yeah, you're, you're born, you're conceived in sin. We don't get a choice about it. Um, so... Yeah, I, I understand the question's always asked, but other, any answer that's different than God gets to choose, and, but here's what scripture says, it would make me uneasy. Um, well, so doesn't it say somewhere in the end of the Bible, like Revelation or mm -hmm. something, that the end will never come until all men have heard about Jesus? Yes, so... Um, That's your answer, then. Yeah, uh, but 
that that's that's all that's always a moving target too in a sense. I understand, um, but I mean, if yeah. you look at how the word has spread to everywhere in the world, yeah, there's very few places in the world today. Well, you so as a for word. instance, I. I had a pastor's conference yesterday in Orlando, and there was a, a representative there from an organization called Lutheran Bible Translators. You know, there, there are a lot of different translating groups, and, uh, and they're, all, they're, all, they're all on the same team. There isn't a Lutheran version of the Bible. It's, it's all the same. Um, but he said, and, and I might get his numbers wrong, but there's 7,000 distinct languages. Let's say, he, let's say it was 6,000, but it's, it's a pretty large number. He said there are full and complete Bibles in 700 of those. So 10%. So to your point, Joan, I, I would say no, not everybody has. Yeah. Um, and again, whether your motive is they need an opportunity to hear for themselves because we love them and we want them to have that, or because you're like, well, until that that word of scripture is fulfilled, Jesus can't come back and boy, look around. We're ready for Jesus to come back. We don't, we don't want it to get worse. No, um, I understand. Yeah, but it, First Peter tells us that God wants all people to be saved, and he is patient, and, and he, he has given more time. But again, there will be a time when the, the bridegroom comes and the virgins have run out of their lamp oil because they thought, oh, I had more time, I had more time. So... We, we live as people who should, should expect Jesus at any moment. Sure. Yeah. So um, it, it's not a bad question, Terry, though. It's not a bad question at all. So, um, but since Bob wasn't here to ask it, I'm glad you did. <laughs> no, he's the one that I he, heard. He, he always. Works, and there wasn't an answer. Yeah, yeah. Also, Diane. When Jesus rose from the dead, mm -hmm. there were lots of other people that rose yeah, witnesses. Lots of those were dead before mm -hmm. Jesus was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So again, it's up to the dear Lord. He's mm -hmm. the judge, and yep. he will. And and in Scripture, it's given to man to live to live and to die yeah. once. So we don't believe in reincarnation. That's that's very clear in Scripture. Um, but again, we do have uh, Enoch. He 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 walked with God, mm -hmm. and and Elijah. Um, and God has given us one thing, but if, if he decides something different, he's God. He, he can do that. It's not really our, our deal to question, but we do know that that's an irregularity. That, that's not the, the normal way. All right, um, so here's 12. We talked about the significance of that. He named apostles and the significance of the word apostle. So... Um, apostle is a word in everyday ordinary language back then. We associate it predominantly as a religious word. So perhaps if you wanted to take it out of its, its religious context, you could think of these people not as apostles but as ambassadors. That to me is the closest comparative that we would have to understand this. When an ambassador is sent, for instance, from our country to another country, they are given a specific commission and power and authority so that our president cannot negotiate a treaty with this country. Like, again, our, our president can only be in one place at one time, but we have these ambassadors and they are given this authority so that when you, foreign country, if you come to an agreement with this person, this ambassador, you need to know that we're not going to change our story or that all that negotiation was all in vain and that didn't mean anything. And now the president like rejects that. That person is given the terms under which an agreement can be made. And if they make an agreement with that country, the country knows it's an agreement made. You know, it's, it's, it's as good as, you know, uh, as if the president were, were there. So an ambassador is distinct from the person, but is given the authority, and there's usually a scope. You know, here's the extent of what you can say and cannot do. Um, you can't just willy-nilly uh, act uh, on behalf of the president and do things out of that. And that's what we're going to see happen with these apostles. They're going to be sent by Jesus. He's the ultimate authority, so they're the ones sent. They're going to have a specific commission. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. This is a, a, an authority that they did not have in themselves, and there, there's a, a limit to it. 
So in this case, it does seem to be of a limited duration. They're sent for this purpose for this time, and they're going to come back and report to Jesus in chapter 6. So we're going to hear about that later, and we would say that's sort of the completion of that ambassadorship or apostleship. And Mark writes the gospel like this. So he does not call these guys apostles more than just these couple times here at the beginning and here at the end. Um, Luke, for instance, though, he very often just back and forth will call the 12 disciples or apostles and doesn't seem to pay any attention. Um, and that seems to be more reflection of how we use the terms of we know how the story ends and they became the apostles who were to go to all of the different nations and what and whatnot. Um, and so Luke, just disciple, apostle, kind of whatever, you, you, you know who I'm talking about. You know these guys, right? And Mark is much more limited. So he's just going to use the word apostle a couple of times, and that's probably more accurate. It retains the exact scope of what they were given to do when and when that ended. Um, so Mark, Mark is more technical with that term, apostles. Uh, what are the apostles supposed to do? So what's the commission? First, so that they might be with him. So it all begins with spending time with Jesus. And while this is talking about apostles, we know that the apostles, they, they first were disciples. And so it's, it's more of the same. Come follow me. Spend time with me. And so we, in our own lives, um, th this is something that I, I wrestle with as, as a church. Should a church have a, a plan of discipleship? And, and if so, what does that look like? And, and I wrestle with that because it's very pragmatic. It makes sense. It gives people some goalposts, some milestones, you know, things to do. Um, the, the problem is that nowhere in, in the New Testament do I ever see anything that looks like a plan of discipleship. Instead, it's, it's something kind of like this, of spend time with Jesus, be, be more like him. In the beginning of the book of Acts, we have an example of maybe, you know, what is the plan of discipleship, that they dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer, um, to the breaking of bread, that they had everything in common, to the fellowship that they have. And so those are sometimes called the marks of the church. This is what the church looks like. But not discipleship per se. Again, discipleship, we tend to be looking more for like, you know, kind of give, give me the Ten Commandments of discipleship. What are the things that I have to do and how can I get good at them? Um, and again, I, I would look at my own life and it's like, how, how am I a disciple of Jesus? And you know, it, it really is. I, I read his word, I'm in worship, pray, um, try to love other people, you know, the, the love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and now when I start to get to that, like, how do I put rules or a plan on loving my neighbor? Because love will depend on each individual circumstance. I cannot love two people the same because they're, they're different. They're going to have different needs. Um, and, and my neighbors are constantly changing and there are, there are degrees of who's my neighbor. So for instance, um, the, the command is love your neighbor as yourself, but in the 10 commandments of the first set of commandments to deal with my neighbor, the fourth commandment is the first of those. The first three deal with God. And that first commandment about our neighbor is about my family. And, and so this is, this is a big thing of, I have a lot of neighbors, but, but my family is closest to me. So if I'm put in a situation where a neighbor outside of my family has a need and my family has a need, I have a conflicting need. How, how do I decide? Well, I, I guess my family would have to get preference, right? Because, um, you know, this person might have a lot of other neighbors, but my family only has 
one husband, one father, you know? Um, so again, but that's messy. It's really messy, isn't it? So how can I give a plan that would work for, for everybody? So instead, it, discipleship it is much messier, I guess. And, and we focus on, well, just spend time with Jesus. That's where it always will begin. And he's leading and guiding all of us. And where he will send each of us individually in our journey of faith, it's going to look a little bit different. And, and I think that's okay because we're all different. I don't want to have to say that, well, you all have to sell everything and be missionaries abroad. Some people, God will call to that. Some people, he won't. And, and that's okay. One of us isn't better than the other. All of those are necessary. Um, so just our own place. I, I just think this is discipleship 101. Spend time with Jesus. And if you spend time with Jesus, I think that implies you will spend time with other people. Because Jesus always, here for instance, he calls a group of people to himself. He doesn't, he doesn't treat these guys one-on-one. -on -one. He calls 12 of them together and says, you're the group, you're it. So if you're only spending time with Jesus and it's just you, I, I would just say, rethink that a little bit maybe because the body of Christ, we're never alone. Um, and if you're with Jesus, again, I assume that means you're in his word, worship, prayer, all of that stuff kind of comes together. So th this, this I think is discipleship 101. And so to be an apostle, it, it, in a sense, it's no different than being, an, it, it cannot start any different. Um, these guys are not given special superpowers independent of their walking with Jesus. Okay, but then there is the distinction that comes, not all disciples are gonna have these next two things. And he might send them out. So first they're gonna be with him, but then the apostle part, the ambassador part is so that he might also send them out. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna preach and they're gonna have authority to cast out demons. To us, the first one sounds pretty ordinary. After all, anybody can call himself a preacher, right, these days. Um, you, you can find your own pedestal, your own platform, and you can say, I'm a preacher, I'm a preacher. In Mark's gospel, that word is different from just speaking. To preach is an authoritative word that cannot be presumed by one's own person. So John was the first person to preach in the gospel. John is sent by God. He, he was that Old Testament prophecy said that God would send that one to prepare the way, and John is that one. Jesus will be the next one to preach, okay? And the apostles now are the third. So it is an authoritative speaking that is connected with bringing the kingdom of God. I of my own authority, I can't bring the kingdom of God. I, I, don't, I don't have that. Only God does. But God has given that authority first to John. Obviously, Jesus has it. And now Jesus is giving it to the disciples. So it's not just that they're going to say, hey, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. It is an authoritative word that, that they are going to share. Again, Mark doesn't say what all the words are that they're going to say, but you have to know that preaching here is an authoritative word. It would probably be tantamount to, in the Old Testament, if this were the same thing, these guys would be called prophets, right? A prophet is one who is given that word from God and they must preach it. They must proclaim it. Um, so it, it does set them out. It is a distinctive task. It, it to us, we, we don't think it's very impressive. What, what would mark us, what would be remarkable to us is the second one, that they also have authority to cast out demons. Preach, we think, no big deal. I'm saying, no, preaching is actually a big deal. So just, just understand that. Not that casting out demons isn't. That, that is a big deal too, but 
you would already have thought that it was a big deal without me commenting on it. Preaching is too. Um, casting out demons, again, only Jesus has done that. John, that was never a part of John's ministry, so we never see John doing that. Jesus does that, and immediately in Mark's gospel, that was a remarkable thing. Jesus is a guy with great authority. Who is the guy that, that does this? But he has no problem doing it. Just at his word, he says it, it happens, um, and he gives that same word to the, the apostles now. So in Jesus' name, they can now do what Jesus did. Um, and, and that would have, just as people looked at Jesus and they're like, who are you that you do this? They're going to look at the disciples, these apostles. Now I messed up. The apostles, when they do this, and they're, they're going to have a desire to say, who are you? But again, they're acting as the representatives. Like, it's not me, guys. It's this guy, Jesus, who has come to bring the kingdom of God. He's going around. Will you be willing to listen to him when he comes? So again, they're, they're kind of preparing the crowd for that reception of him. All right. Um, so that's the apostles. What it is that they have to accomplish, um, it starts with being with him, spend time with him, so that he would then send them out to preach, to cast out demons. They have that authority. Um, strong emphasis on authority. Jesus can share his authority. That will be important somewhat later on in the story. All right, 1057. I'm going to just um, start with he appointed the 12. 14 and 16 starts the same. He appointed the 12, da 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 da. He appointed the 12. I think Mark is repeating himself with these two little interludes. He's appointing the 12, and then it's saying, what's so significant about the 12? So that's that they're going to be apostles, and that they're going to have this distinct authority. And then the other thing to know about them is who they are. Um, and so he kind of, he starts himself twice. Um, I said this last time, if, if you can recall. Um, this is all an oral class. Now there's stuff that's written down, but I, I tend to repeat things because we need to hear things twice. And so I said last time as we ended it, we, we believe that Mark's gospel would have been received by most people through their ears rather than through their eyes. So you kind of know how this is. Sometimes if you start to say something and then you get, you're like, oh, but wait, you got to know about this. And then you go back and you're like, okay, now let me get back to what I said. This, this would be an instance of that orally. So he appointed 12 and whom he named apostles and oh, apostles, they do this. He appointed the 12. What I wanted to do was to give you the names of them, but, but I got a little sidetracked again. It's, it's, it's a very deliberate thing. Um, and it, and it appeals to the ears, to the eyes, it might look a little bit messy. You're like, wait a second, you, you, you just said that. Like, I can, I can read that. But it, it's, it's one of those signs that, again, Mark knows that people are going to hear this. So when you know something's going to be heard, you write it that way. So my sermons, this was something that was really well drilled into me in the seminary. My sermons, I write them to be heard. And this, this has affected the way that I write because I do so much writing of sermons. Um, sometimes it's not really good English. Sometimes there are incomplete sentences or dangling participles or whatever, which technically in, in written word is is messy it's, it's it's ugly but i'm not writing a thing to present to my professor to be read i'm writing something that i know will be heard and and so there are things that you do because you know this this is it's going to be received differently and and so i i think mark he's he's no amateur he he knows how to write not just to be read, but to be heard. Um, 
and and so sometimes the gospels are impugned but because they were written by illiterate men um because like peter's a fisherman a fisherman's not schooled in fine writing was you know this guy's not going to be able to write well um and and some of that is true when we read the new testament in its original greek um it's not it's not what's called classical greek it's not it's not very good professional um greek but you can still read it you can understand it 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 gives you that idea of well maybe it wasn't written to be professional written greek it was written to be consumed by regular ordinary people which then does affect translation of the bibles right because sometimes there are things that are very clear and sometimes there are things that are very ambiguous or unclear and sometimes translators think it's their job to smooth all of that over for people and i'm of the mind of that's actually over translating in a sense because they knew what they were doing they they knew that there was a problem there but they wrote it that way and so we in our english you know okay you know that when that's going to come up in bible study there're going to be questions about that but they also knew that when they wrote it originally um it's all inspired yeah absolutely yeah god god knows what he's doing so next time we'll read the names of the 12 and we'll talk about their biographies very briefly as we know them. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, uh you have called us to be your disciples. Uh we don't often understand what a great privilege that is that you desire us, that you called us to yourself, that you uh through the waters of baptism, through the word have called us to be sons and daughters of the most high God, adopted into his family to be part of the kingdom of God. And and that's all because of your grace that that you loved us. And um to know that we have received that it should change our lives. each and every day we should wake up and and thank and praise you that that you would do that for us it should change the way we interact with other people that we shouldn't see other people as as all of the problems or all of the things that they might present to us but that we would see in them other people that that you too want in your kingdom and we pray lord that you would help us to live not only with such gratitude in ourselves but that we would be able to share that gratitude and blessing to other people because uh it is your grace that saves us and and it should give us pause each and every day for it is such a a part of who you are that we can never truly understand but we are so thankful for in jesus name we pray amen, amen. all right thank you everybody <laughs>